Welcome everyone to another episode of Customer Success Talks, Real Challenges, Experts Advice. I'm your host, Byron Teruño, and just like you, I'm still learning this amazing world of customer success. And what an amazing way of doing this, that going out there and talking to amazing people, people who have from two years, one year of experience, all the way to 10, 15, and even 20 years of experience, as you have seen here before. Today's not going to be the exception. We have been working together with today's guest to bring you an amazing episode. And we want to at least for you to have one insight that you can implement, one strategy that you can implement on your day-to-day -day activities to remove any challenge that makes our day. So what are we going to talk about? Today, we're going to be talking about operationalizing customer success. We're going to be talking about metrics. We're going to be talking about collaborating with other departments. That's our goal today. And for that, we have another amazing guest in, in today's episode, and this is Rob Sambito. So probably you have seen his post out there. You have seen him in the daily, daily stand-up show from Dylan as well. And today he's here with us. So let me go ahead and introduce you, Bob. I mean, Rob, I even changed your name now. Rob. <laughs> Some people call me Bob. Oh, there you go. So today you're going to be Rob. My wife Bob. doesn't like that very much. Oh, really? Oh, let's see what she thinks about this one then. <laughs> Rob, so you have over 10 years of experience in customer success, and you are the founder of Success Scaled, which helps SaaS startups establish scalable, repeatable processes and operations in post-sale and go-to-market functions. You help to transform CS teams from reactive call centers of a business to proactive revenue generating functions. Those are really powerful words. Thank you, Rob, for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it, Byron. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Amazing, man. Thank you for all your time uh, during the, to, for this planning, for the planning of this episode. And I want to start by, why don't you tell us a little bit about success scale? What do you do? Yeah. So uh, thanks again for having me. Uh, so Success Scaled is a consulting practice that I started about four years ago, oh, wow. uh, four years and a month at this point, um, which is focused on helping build and scale customer success teams and helping turn customer success teams into proactive revenue generating functions. So sometimes that's a one-two punch. We do it all in one go. But uh -huh. sometimes it's more we for focus more on one versus the other. So we focus either on just the foundational building blocks of customer success. So I have sort of a six month program that we typically run through to get CS teams to scale where they try. Essentially, I try to jam pack everything I learned in probably the first four years I was in this field into about six months um, and learn from my mistakes along the way. Um, and uh and then the alternative path is that uh, the task at hand is something more about the financial metrics, the financial health of the CS team, whether it's about training CS teams to bring in more net new revenue and really improve NRR, or sometimes it's about efficiency motions that help margins. So all depends on the client use case, which we figure out based on a maturity assessment. That's so cool. That's so cool. By the way, everyone listening to today's episode or if you are in youtube and you're watching us go to the about section and there you're going to find all the information how to contact rob if you have any questions into how success scaled works and um yeah so first of all let's start going into more into the today's topic rob and i want to ask you about your opinion in regards to operationalizing customer success as being the first pillar for the customer journey. Now, before you answer this, in the book of Seven Pillars of Customer Success, which I recommend everyone to read from Wayne McCulloch, he says, the first pillar, operationalizing customer success, is arguably the most important pillar for the, but the less understood. Operationalizing customer success is the pillar that allows all the other pillars to function properly. Without it, the framework is dead in the water. I would love to hear your opinion about this. Do you agree or do you disagree? I wish I could agree. Uh, Oof. Oof. <laughs> with our dear friend, Wayne, whoever he is out there, I hope he's not listening. Um, 
but no, I, I, so, so I have to, I have to disclaim that I have not read the book. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if maybe his explanation would bring us closer to the same page, but <clears throat> when I hear that the first pillar, when I hear first pillar, I think it's the first thing you do right. and that you're not supposed to do other things until you do that. And when I hear that this is apparently the first thing you're supposed to do is operationalizing customer success, I ask myself, well, what does that mean? Mm. And to me, it's about thinking about the operations, uh, the inter interdepartmental relationships, the KPIs, the day-to-day -day affairs. None of that matters if you don't have a customer and if you don't know what those value outcomes are for that customer. So like, I think about this, I think about the first time I ever sold a product, um, my own product. Obviously, I feel like I've sold things since I was a waiter at a diner when I was a kid growing up. Mm -hmm. um, but the first time I, I ever started a business, I was 22 years old and had just graduated college and I had a food product called Fruzy. And I was thinking so hard about how do I raise money to launch my first store? And how do I go to market? And ooh, let me focus on the logo and the branding and the pricing strategy and uh, the, the referral strategy. And, and, and I was driving myself crazy for probably like over six months, thinking about all these details, obsessing over these details that were all hypotheticals. And I finally met this guy who would then become my business partner, business partner. Can I curse on this show? You can, please, please be okay. the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so Budo, my business partner to be, he looked at me, he said, kid, there's you, there's your customer. You have your product, they have their money. You just exchange those two things and that's it. That's the business. So don't waste wow. your time thinking about branding and don't tell me that you're waiting on your marketing expert. You're the marketing expert. Don't tell me that you're waiting on your investor. You're the investor. So get the product to market. And so I said, well, how do I do? <laughs> I was like, you know, taken, a, taken aback by this. And I was like, okay, well, how do I do that? Right. And he's like, there's a farmer's market next week. Show up, be there, sell your product. And I didn't, I was not ready. I was not ready to get to market. I didn't have everything operationalized. You know, I looked at all my forecasts and everything like that. Guess what? They were all wrong. And so all this operation effort to operationalize that I did before I actually had the product in the customer's hand was all vapor. It was all nonsense. So my point is to say, as it pertains to customer success, right? right? It's the same idea. It's the same concept that your customer comes to you with certain value in mind that they're looking to get from your product and a certain journey that they'll go through. So I think if there is any first pillar, it's the customer journey and it's the value they're getting from your product. Not, not the operate, not the internal operations, not the KPIs, not the funding, not, none of that. <laughs> it's just you and your product and your customer and you just connect the dots. Interesting. <laughs> Everything is a learning process. Like you, those words <laughs> years ago, and now you still have them in mind and, and, and now they're gonna stick with me too. This is this is so interesting. So, but where does operationalizing customer success comes into play then? So, so it's it's as soon as you have consistent, repeatable results across your customers. Um, so, you know, maybe you can call it the second pillar, right? Mm. But I I did want to even break that down further, if I may. When I hear operationalizing, that's a very big term, and so I often find that what people often need to to do is look across a couple different axes. First is the customer journey, right? Because it's very different to quote unquote operationalize mm -hmm. onboarding from renewals, from upsells, from customer advocacy. And the other axis is, like I said, operationalizing is this big word. You actually have to, in my experience, you have to look at it in different sort of silos, different buckets, different pieces. And so the big pieces within this bucket of operationalizing customer success to me is looking at people ops. So do you have the right people in the right seats, doing the right jobs with the right job descriptions, the right key performance indicators, the right interdepartmental relationships, customer ops. So do, do my customers actually enjoy the experience of being a customer? And how am I measuring that over time? Am I putting in place things like 
voice of the customer programs, which I know you're a big fan of, <laughs> or customer advisory boards or sentiment analysis, those kinds of things. And then the last bucket is RevOps. So people ops, customer ops. RevOps is the systems and processes, the set of systems and processes that uphold the whole operation. So that's where you can look at your tech providers, your CSPs, your um, instance of Salesforce or HubSpot. If you're using an onboarding tool, if you're using, using conversational intelligence, if you're using digital strategies, those all fall in RevOps in my mind. Right. So if you have good people ops, customer ops, and rev ops, you're all set. <laughs> Sounds simple, right? Well, <laughs> if it was, <laughs> I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> right, there's a uh, definitely, definitely. And one of the challenges that we're going to tackle today, um, Rob, it's about defining and implementing consistent metrics across the organization. And this is a question that I would love to for you to tackle in two ways, in a view of a startup and in a view of a company that is not anymore considered a startup. Mm -hmm. What strategies do you suggest for defining and implementing CS metrics that will set the customer and the whole CS framework for success? Uh, I wish I was wearing something from my last Halloween costume. Oh, wow. It's a, <laughs> it's a necklace with a big dollar sign on it. <laughs> <laughs> money, money, um, money. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I think that the reason I say that is because I think that a lot of times defining the right KPI starts with defining on a first principles basis, why does our customer success team exist? And most customer success teams that I've been a part of, they exist to wear that big dollar sign around their neck, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a revenue function. It's a revenue generating function, and it requires a degree of financial savvy to be really good in the role, um, to excel in the role. Um, other customer success teams that I have seen are built differently. Some are built as more administrative functions. Uh, some are built more as cost centers of the business. Um, and and I think that the way the KPIs that you look at are quite different depending on which of those paths you choose. So assuming that you're building a proactive revenue generating function, the KPIs that matter most, really it's NRR is the God metric. And so you look at the things that drive high net revenue retention or NRR, which if you haven't heard that term before and you're listening to this podcast, net revenue retention is the amount of money that you retain from your customers, from a segment of your customers over time. And ideally you want that number to be more than hundred percent, which means that you're expanding your customers past the amount that they were paying you last year for that cohort of customers. So if you look at that God metric, there, the main things that feed into that are primarily churn or retention and expansion by way of upsell and cross-sell. Mm -hmm. There's sort of like a the step cousin that's off to the side is customer advocacy. That's a big important function of customer success teams where the relevant KPI is around referrals primarily and uh, actually measuring customer success by the extent to which customer success can expedite the deal flow for new sales and mm -hmm. increase sales velocity. Basically, but really the primary ones are retention and expansion basically making your customer the, your sales part of your sales team at that point yeah obviously. right well it's it's a part of the sales team i wouldn't quite say part of the sales team necessarily only because i worry that people would misinterpret it i know right. you and i are on the same page when we say that but um i don't i would i don't mean that to say cs reports up to sales but i do mean that cs is used as a lever to drive down the cost of sales and sales deal cycle times. Yeah, I was talking more about the customer in the advocacy yeah. fund. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of other KPIs that buzz around customer success that are probably in the backs of people's minds. You're like, well, where does NPS fit into that? Mm -hmm. Where does CSAT fit into that? Where does usage metrics fall into that? Where does time to value? And basically, or you know, even support metrics like resolution time, first response time. The answer is that those all feed those, those are all leading indicators that feed into the bigger picture of the things that touch the dollars and cents for a CS team. 
So some practical advice for anyone listening is find out what financial metrics you can get your hands on and get access to and try to become a master of that data in addition to the customer data, because then you can start to see some cool relationships between the two. Is Would this apply to an enterprise company as well? Or by then, they will, it's already a mature company, so everything evolves different. Well, I think what happens, and when you say enterprise company, you mean like, as in an enterprise company that ha that has a customer success department? Yeah, yeah. The thing that happens there is there becomes a lot more of a divide between the individual practitioner and the financial underpinnings of the business. So if you're a CSM at Google, or maybe not Google, but let's pick, you know, imagine some large private company. If you're a CSM at some large private company, you may not have access to the financial data and you might get ignored or pushed away if you ask for that kind of thing. So, you know, that's entirely a possibility that um, we won't be able to see the direct connection between our efforts and the financial outcomes of the business. Right. But I actually think that there's a responsibility for leadership to draw that connection as clearly and obviously as possible in the way of dashboards and workflows that show results. And all of this is about collaboration, internally collabor internal collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. And this is part of the second challenge that we want to tackle here, Rob. And it's about integrating customer success workflows with other departments, let's say sales, product, engineering, marketing, you name it, right? And right. I'm just a super fan of voice of the customer framework. It's just a big framework. You know, you can start simple or you can over-engineer it as well. Mm. But if you start simple, you start adding to it. I One of the outcomes of it is that it will remove silos between departments mm -hmm. because everyone will be um, on top of the voice of the customer, what the customer is saying, and each one will give their perspective and understand how the other teams are working on. Of course, there's a lot of up to down um, pushing in, into that initiative. But I will say that one is the voice of the customer framework. And the other one for me is having the, a clear journey mapping where everyone will have an eagle eye of the customer journey because depending yeah. on the journey is the feedback as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, those are my two to go always when it comes to this. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. I will say, can I share an observation on that? Oh, please do it. So... What I will say is that that what you just described, yeah. most of the customer programming and customer journey mapping, most of the time I see product teams' eyes light up when they hear that. And so I see how that helps build the bridge between CS and product and align on, for example, most product teams, they really, they get so frustrated with their customer success teams because their <laughs> customer success teams don't dig enough into the pains the customer exp right. is experiencing or why the customer is asking for what they're asking for. So customer success teams will just throw a feature request over the fence and say, hey, yeah, the customer thinks that, um, you know, we need to add uh, a logo on this page. And it's like, product teams like, why? What's hurting? Why is this, wh what are the use cases, right? So, so that, I think what you're describing, customer journey mapping, voice of the customer programming, does a really, really good job of building that connection between CS and product. Mm -hmm. And it makes the customer success person's job a lot more engaging. You know, we often don't have time for this kind of thing, <laughs> which is why we cut the corners in the first place. True. Um, but this is a recommendation in, if you're in customer success to push yourself to try to carve out that time. As far as whether sales and marketing teams care about the voice of the customer program, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I... I've worked with sales teams. I've worked with marketing teams that, okay, I'm going to tell you two quick anecdotes. Go Can for I it, go for it? Yeah, yeah. So please. I worked with the, the first like career salesperson I worked with. Uh, I was like, don't you care about what our customers are going through? And he said, Rob, as soon as I swipe their credit card, I never want to talk to them again. Yeah. Never again. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> now, should should he have cared a bit more? You know, arguably, yes, but maybe not. Maybe really, you know, his directive was net new sales. Meanwhile, then 
I was talking with the marketing person. Now this is years later, same company. I was talking with the, the marketing leader and I had to cancel him. I've worked with this person for years and I had to cancel a meeting with this person. I was like, like, look, sorry. You're like, I can't make the meeting. We just have a bunch of bugs. And he pauses and he goes, we have bugs. And I was like, <laughs> dude, do you realize what I do for work? <laughs> exactly. Now, would voice of the customer programming and customer journey mapping help him understand that? Absolutely. And it would have saved me some headaches. But the thing is, he didn't necessarily have to have that awareness to be really good at his job because both these guys were great at their jobs, but they weren't incentivized to care about the customer journey nearly as much as we are and product is. Right. I mean, that's somehow is the cruel reality. Yeah. It's the cruel reality. And that's where leadership as well plays a crucial, a crucial role. I will say. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great point. Uh, what you just said is so much wisdom that took me a long time to learn that none of none of these interdepartmental relationships would work until we got managerial alignment mm -hmm. from the top. So I had to learn that management had no interest in adjudicating disputes between departments, but I had to get enough of their time and attention for them to align departments with the same frameworks like the ones we're describing and create incentives around those frameworks too, right? Mm. Like I've heard of product teams that are comped on retention rate. And that's pretty interesting. Right? It's bold, it's unusual, but I think it's pretty cool. I don't know, good you're food touching, for thought. You're touching really, really good points here, um, Rob. I love it. I'm just analyzing and processing everything as well. We have covered the metrics. We have covered the collaboration of, of CS with other departments and what strategies can come and help. But I'm now wondering about digital customer success. There's digital marketing. There's digital customer success as well. And a big, a big hi to Alex Turkovich here. I invite everyone to go to his podcast, Digital Customer Success. It will be in the about section. But what is your point of view on this one? Would it actually make a big impact in when it comes to operationalizing customer success, Rob? It makes a big impact when you're ready. Mm. Um, and it makes a big impact depending on what your goals are. I'll, I'll define what the what I mean by those. Yeah. Starting with what your goals are. Um, if your goals are maximizing product adoption, digitizing customer success might not be the move for you, depending on the stage you're at. Right. Right. Digitizing customer success can maybe increase automation and volume of notifications that customers get, but they don't necessarily increase adoption. So, I mean, that they're designed to. But mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Like I, I signed up, I just casually signed up for Duolingo Italian recently. And I was really? so annoyed that this thing kept bothering me with these passive aggressive yeah, notifications. Post. Yeah. It was just like, it was like, Hey, just checking in it's duo <laughs> here or whatever the thing's name is. And I was like, duo, leave me alone. I'm busy. And <laughs> Wait, you just, it, you just call it Duo? It's not your, your bestie that you said Duo instead of Duolingo? It's called Duo, the bird, right? Isn't it? Mm, I always call it Duolingo, though. Hmm. Well, I think the bird's name is Duo. Ah, okay. Okay, damn it. I think it might have changed its name recently. I don't know. Probably but after your post. Reminds me, it reminds me of, remember Clippy on Microsoft Word? Oh, so like, and by the way, this whole idea here. of digital customer success in many ways <laughs> is not new. <laughs> it's just done better now. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I see these different strategies being put in place. Like, for example, I was using Notion and Notion was like, hey, do you want to try our new AI feature? And I was like, hell yeah, why not? Click that. And, and then it was like, okay, great. We'll send a message to your admin to purchase this. And I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't realize that you were trying to upsell me. Um, but uh, yeah, so digital customer success motions can actually be 
deleterious to building a strong client relationship right. and promoting really strong client adoption, client value outcomes. Um, honestly, if like I was, if I got a phone call from Duolingo, which I never would, doesn't make any sense for them. But hypothetically, if I got a phone call from Duolingo to walk me through the app and you know encourage me to use it, if I got a phone call from Notion or whatever, I'd be way more responsive. Mm. Um, so depends on what your goals are for starters. If your goals are like efficiency and margins, often makes sense to do digital. Maybe the other thing I, I just want to make sure people do is implement at the right time. Because I've seen people try to do things like launch a customer community when they're not ready. And then next thing they know, either it totally goes off the rails or it's complete crickets. Nobody's even talking in the community and it's just a big failed effort. There's pros and cons. <laughs> There's pros and cons and the cons are big. Yeah. They work as well. Rob, thank you so much for bringing all of those 10 years of experience and humility into one place and bringing your voice into all of the people who are listening to customer success talks, real challenges, expert advice. To start wrapping up today's episode, Rob, any closing words that you have? Yeah, I just, well, I want to apologize if I sound overly cynical. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good way to start. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, I'm really inspired by the work that I see all these colleagues and customer success doing. It's really exciting. Amazing. And and I'm I'm really, really pleased by a lot of what I see. Um, people like yourself, Byron. Oh, thank you. Um, do I have any last words beyond that? I would just say that if anybody needs any help um implementing these strategies, uh, let me know. Um, I'm not only, you know, happy to help myself, but I try to keep a whole network of people who are available and you know, people who are smarter and more experienced at certain things than I am, who I can intro you to. Um, so it, it would be my pleasure to be the connective tissue that helps uh, get the right resources to the right places. I want to be like the CSM to the whole industry if I can be, you know? Cool. <laughs> cool. That's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be, my friend. It's so easy to have a conversation for you and with you, sorry. It's so easy to have a conversation with you. And thank you very much again for your time, for volunteering to do this. It's time to, to close today's episode. And I just want to remind everyone that we're now expanding to Latin America. And it's our Spanish version. Pura Vida. Pura Vida, exactly. <laughs> and if you don't know what Pura Vida means, you have to go to Google. Go and search what Pura Vida means. And we are now expanding to Latin America. We want to also see how everything done in that part of the world and what challenges they're going through. And we have two amazing hosts who are there always bringing a lot of um, amazing professionals. Go into the about section. If you don't speak Spanish, trust me, you're going to learn. You're going to learn Spanish. And um, yeah, just go and say hi. Just pass by and say hi. Rob, thank you very much for today's episode again. And everyone, remember, keep growing, keep learning, and let's keep improving the world of customer success. Until next time. Thanks, Brian.